This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. This is Sarah, and I just want to take a moment to speak to you about this week's sponsor, Favor. Favor Inc. is a statewide family led nonprofit 501c3 organization that is committed to empowering families as advocates and partners in improving educational and health outcomes for our children. Favor is the Connecticut State Organization of the Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. Favor offers a single place for families with children who have medical, mental, emotional, and behavioral health challenges to find information, assistance, and training. To find out more about Favor, please go to favor-ct.org. We are grateful for our opportunity to work with Favor as a sponsor, and now on to the rest of the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caregiver Chronicles. My name is Sarah, and today I am here with Dr. Ed Spink. Hello, Dr. Spink. Um, How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. And again, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to reach out to all caregivers so that they know that they can, um, that there's hope that they can overcome their compassion fatigue and burnout. Thank you. And I'm so excited to have you here. You are a former chaplain, a former RN, an executive healthcare leader, and you're known as the caregiver caregiver. You're also the founder of the Soul of Caregiving Coaching Practice and an author. Um, That's a lot. Would you like to further introduce yourself? Yes, I I like to say that um, I'm I'm the caregiver's caregiver because I learned from my own experience that you need to reach out to others when you're experiencing some type of uh, trauma or being overwhelmed by the aspects of caregiving. And I, I often say that we're all caregivers. Sometimes we just think people that work in healthcare are the only caregivers. But at the heart of being human is to care. So parents who care for their children are caregivers. Uh, spouses who care for each other are caregivers. First responders, uh, social workers, therapists, clergy persons, educators, we're all caregivers because we care. And so I like to focus on that. And my background has helped me become the caregiver that I am. About 30 years ago, I suffered from severe compassion fatigue and burnout. And it was through the help of this wonderful counselor that I had that he really saved my life. And so I want to dedicate my life to helping others who feel hopeless and feel there's no way of of ending the exhaustion that they have because they care. Yeah. And I appreciate that as someone who's been in that position where I was feeling extreme burnout and, you know, possibly even compassion fatigue. um, I appreciate that because people like you are keeping me going and paving paving the path for me to try to give back and share my story as well. Um, And I'm grateful for that. So can you just tell my audience the difference between compassion fatigue and burnout? Yes, it's often confused. Compassion fatigue has to do with normal caregiving. It's something we love to do. A mother loves loves to be a mother. A, A father loves to be a father. Educators love to be educators. Nurses and doctors and therapists and clergy people love love the work that they do. And it's because we love the work that we often get into what's called compassion fatigue. Charles uh, Figley wrote a book called Compassion Fatigue. And what he says is, we are all 
caregivers because we care. And because we care, we experience compassion fatigue. And we pick up vicariously the, the traumas of those we care for. And it's important to know that because we care. Compassion fatigue is because we love what we do, but we get exhausted and we don't take care of ourselves. And caregivers are notorious, and I was too, in not taking care of myself. And so we get, we get into this place of severe exhaustion. Burnout, on the other hand, has to deal with working in a situation where, where we're never accepted for the gifts that we give. It's like beating our head against the wall. We're a clog in the wheel, and we keep on trying and trying and trying because we're very I- idealistic. But that particular organization or the particular situation we're in forces us to feel that we're not accepted. And what often happens, and it happened in my own case, I had to leave that situation because it was so dysfunctional. And why was I allowing myself to ex- to stay in that situation where I, I knew I could do something much better? So compassion fatigue deals with something you love. Burnout deals with something you love also, but it, you're not getting any type of reinforcement. Your gifts are not being accepted. And especially during the pandemic, you know, the doctors and nurses and, and parents at home who, had, who are forced to be educators, you know, they had they were beating their head against the wall trying to ask for help. You know, and finally they did get it, uh, but it took so much effort. And so that's the major difference between burnout and, and compassion fatigue. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I have heard those words used interchangeably before. Um, so I, I just appreciate that. Um, do you know what the statistics are with family caregivers or just caregivers in general who experience compassion fatigue and or burnout? It's a large percentage and uh, off the top of my head, it, it's not clear, but I would, I would say from what I remember, you know, maybe 50% of caregivers experience some type of compassion fatigue and burnout. And they experience it again because they have not learned the difference between self-care and other care. So as caregivers, we're very idealistic. We want to care. It, it's who we are. And, and yet at the same time, we avoid self-care. I often say that the antidote to burnout and, and, and compassion fatigue is self-care. And I, I call it soul care because it, it, it deals with the capacity to get in touch with the deepest parts of who we are as a person. And I call that soul that we could call it a conscience or we could call it getting in touch with our higher power, however we want to determine it. But it's that spark in us that leads us to do the work that we do. It not only leads us, it refreshes us. And so oftentimes I'll ask caregivers, are you a better person because of the work that you do? And they say, yes, I am. But what they don't do is that they don't stop and reflect on that. That's, that's, that's the soul food is reflecting, is reflecting on the fact that, you know, I really did a good job. And I really appreciate um, myself. It's not that I have to keep on proving who I am. It's, it's, it, it just reinforces who I am. And it's, it's not a sense of a life, life work balance. It's a sense of, you know, I'm the same person who, caregiving as I, as I am doing other things. It, it, it's, not, it's not dualistic. Exactly. And there are um, so many caregivers who their their life outside of their job is also caregiving for children, a grandparent, parent, a spouse, a sibling, whoever. Um, there's always that overlap. And for those people, to them, sometimes self-care is 
what they would consider self-care would be taking a shower without someone knocking on the door. Um, and to me, I, I decided not that long ago that that's not self-care, that that is, that is basic hygiene that I am absolutely entitled to. And that self-care is that step above. It might be listening to music while I'm in the shower and having a dance party or lighting an incense or a candle to kind of make it feel more spa-like or relaxing. Um, would you agree that your basic needs are not self-care? <laughs> I, I would say that. And, and I would also say that oftentimes caregivers don't take care of their basic needs. And so right from the get-go, it could be the start of real self-care. You know, I'm going to take a longer shower. I'm going to take a longer walk. I'm going to um, do something that I've been put off for years. Like, I really want to read that book, but I just never have the time. The iron, irony is that we do have the time. We just have to manage it better. And that means a letting go of that of that. I, I almost use the term addiction. We can become addicted to self-care, whereas we don't um, give ourselves time to be who we really are. I mean, who we really are is because we care. But how do you turn that around to say, if I care for others, I can use the same skills to care for myself. It's not different skills to so the same skills. So uh, just as I'm ready and willing to to do so many things for others, I can be ready and willing to start doing something for myself. Often caregivers, and you may, I've had that experience, and you may have the experience that we feel guilty. Oh, what do you mean I can take care of myself? Or or, or, or we feel uh, uh, that we're being selfish. Well, I remember dealing with a client once who spent years taking care of her father who had Alzheimer's, and she always felt guilty if she just paused and took care of herself. She also felt, am I being selfish? So where does that come from? I think it comes from our culture that says we always have to be perfect. We always have to be, you know, open to take care of others. Instead of, you know, let's take care of ourselves. I, in, in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, it says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Wow. You know, did you get up this morning and look in the mirror and say, wonderful are your gifts, O Lord? You know, you, you knit me in my mother's womb. That's from one of the Psalms. You know, then it says, wonderful. Did you wake up feeling wonderful? Can you, can you allow yourself to feel that energy of, of, of giftedness that you are being created? And no matter what your spiritual um, uh, tradition is, that you feel wonderful in, 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 in light of who your higher power or God is. So it, it's, it's, it's an important aspect. And I, I often say, and I like the distinction you said about hygiene. But I like I like the 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 focus that it's step by step. So in the beginning, it might be I'm going to take care of my hygiene. You see, whereas I put it off, I don't shave as much as I should, or I don't I don't um, um, take care of my hair or my nails or whatever. I put off that pedicure. I put off anything that's going to help. I put off that massage. You know, anything that's going to get me out of my head and into the, my body that's saying that's screaming for attention. Yeah, no. And I thank you for that. Um, just because I like, again, I see so many caregivers who don't have time to go to the doctor and, and it's that's it's to them. The doctor is self-care. And it's like, I think that that's your basic you know, going, going for your checkups and your doctor's appointment as a caregiver are so important because how are you going to survive long enough to take care of the people you take care of? You get them to every single appointment they need to be. You need to make sure you're doing it for yourself too. Um, and I, and I've done that as, as a mom and as a caregiver, like 
nope, don't have time to go for my checkup because I'm working and I have my kids and I have this and I have that. And it's like, my body will start to tell me, you know, our bodies will tell us, our bodies will say, nope, something's wrong. Gotta go. Um, and I think I, I do. I think that those most basic needs, just, we should count those as basic needs. We have to meet those and then we can do our self-care. It's, it's that next step. Like, like you're saying, I think, I think we're in complete agreement on that. I, and I, and I appreciate talking about it because I feel like it's just not talked about enough. So I'd like to talk a little bit about your time working in hospice care. What inspired you to do that type of work? When I did my master's in counseling psychology, I, I spent time in, in my thesis on how is the caregiver supported when they're dealing with end of life issues. I've always been interested in our culture that seems to only celebrate end of life issues on Halloween where we make fun of fun of, of dying. And it's like the D word. Doctors have have a reluctance to say to the their uh, clients and patients that, you know, I really want to let you know that your your mother is is dying. And so we're going to do palliative care and then we're going to move into hospice care. Excuse me. <clears throat> I always were working in, in acute care and that led me to hospice care. I always was interested in supporting families and patients to be able to be open to the possibility of how to live as they're dying instead of, instead of, you know, a denial in what's going on. What encourages, what encouraged me as a hospice a chaplain was to be able to hold them in the tension of what was going on. I had a, a, a client who was dying with lung disease and she was really the, the bell of the party. She loved to play the piano and she loved to drink and she was always happy. And she used to go to Las Vegas and get involved and, and she was a real go-getter, but here she was dying with lung cancer. And, um, she called me one day and I asked her how she was. Could I come over? And she said, no, no, not today. Come tomorrow. I'm feeling really down. And so I said, okay, I'll come tomorrow. You know, I made sure she was okay. And so I went, I went there tomorrow, the next day. And I said, what's happening? And she said, I, I feel, excuse the word crappy. Well, she didn't use crappy. She said something else. And I said, why? And she said, because I talked to my children that, that I was dying and they wouldn't accept it. And so I asked her, um, you know, would she allow me to speak to them? And she said, yes. But as she went on and she said that she was feeling, excuse me, shitty, I burst into song and I said, I feel shitty, oh, so shitty. I feel shitty and witty and gay. Well, she burst into laughter. And because she recognized that I heard her. And that's another aspect of, of caregiving. Uh, caregivers don't want advice. They want to be heard. They want their story to be heard. And all caregivers experience uh, some type of trauma in their work. And it's normal to experience what's happening instead of denying what's happening. And that leads me into the three cultural taboos, which we can talk about that caregiver, caregivers face. But I found being that person that holds the family and patient during this crisis is one of the most rewarding aspects of caregiving. And, and so I just kept on doing that. And, 
And then prior to my working in hospice, I was in acute care. And oftentimes I was asked to intervene with a family and a doctor about the end of life care, because it's again, one of those things that Doctors will say to their family members, what do you want me to do? Well, when they say that, the family feels they're pulling the plug. They're causing the death of the loved one. And what needs to be said instead of that is, is Mrs. Smith, I want you to know that your mom is, isn't doing very well and her time here is limited. And I want you to know we're going to take care of her. Uh, and and make sure she's comfortable, but she's dying. They're they're reluctant to say that, and 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 I'm going to I'm going to give make a referral to hospice. Often people, or excuse me, doctors send their patients to hospice too late, instead of you know earlier where they the hospice team is 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 trained to hold them in a crisis and i use the term hold meaning that the metaphor i use is if a child is hurting and runs to the parent what does the parent do the parent grabs them and holds them and so something as simple as i'm going to hold that person i'm going to hold that family uh in this crisis i'm going to be with them helps them make appropriate choices and decisions I can go into the three cultural taboos if you'd like me to. Um, actually, that's funny because that was one of my questions on my list. So, okay. Um, yes, I would love that. We in 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 the West, is particularly in in America and Canada, we have this sense that we we have almost have to be perfect. Well, none of us are perfect, and it comes from the Horatio Alger myth that. If we only try hard enough, we can do it. And so what we learn is that we're individuals and individualistic also, that we're like Superman and Superwoman, that we can take care of it by ourselves. Well, unfortunately, being uh, human, we're relational. And when we're in touch with, with uh, trauma, the best aspect is to ask for help. And that's what caregivers generally don't do because we're trained not to do that. We're trained to just get into the job, get it done and, and, and get out of it. And so the first cultural taboo is, is not to trust those inner feelings that are going on within ourselves. You know, our body, our psyche, our soul is trying to tell us there's something, there's an issue that needs to be looked at. And we're, distrustful with ourself and listening to that we're also distrustful to our family our friends our teammates because we're we're embarrassed we're, we feel shame to acknowledge to the, to them that i need help so the first uh, first taboo is not to ask is not to trust yourself and therefore ask for help the second taboo is we're also conditioned to not tell our story if we if we experience a traumatic event uh something as simple as 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 um feeling overwhelmed or or also experience the death of one of the people we're caring for uh, can we share that you know can first responders share the trauma they feel when they go to an automobile accident and someone is killed and so the sense is that if we acknowledge what we're what what's going on within ourselves, we're weak. We're we, we're not up to the job, and so we don't share our stories. And because we don't share our stories, we become, become more and more isolated. Which leads to the third taboo: is that we don't share our feelings. Feelings are dangerous. Emotions are dangerous, and we don't share what we're feeling. We're taught stiff upper lip. Big boys don't cry, and and big girls are too emotional, and they're both wrong. Because we do experience normal 
reactions to traumatic events. It's normal to feel sad. It's normal to feel overwhelmed. It's normal to feel, um, not to feel that we're numb because of that experience that just happened to us. And so overcoming those three taboos is, is learning to trust and reach out, learning to tell our story and, and looking for someone that will hear us. Earlier, I mentioned that I had a wonderful coach uh, that helped me, and and he saved my life. Something within me, when I reached that that bottom place in me, said, get help. And and that's what often happens. That that voice still still screams out and get help, and, and I did. And so when we get help, we're able to tell our story and be heard. And once we're heard, you know, we're able to make appropriate choices and decisions. And if we share our emotions, then we're able to be honest with ourselves instead of waiting for a time bomb to go off. Because if we don't acknowledge what we're feeling, you know, we keep, holding them in, you know, stiff upper lip and, and et cetera. And, and the bottom line is we need to tell somebody. And that's, that's being human. That's not being inhuman. So when you, when you experience, you know, of uh, healthcare professionals um, being, you know, not sharing what's going on with their peers. I think I mentioned once that a, a doctor that I was working with in, in, in intensive care, I said, do you ever share your, um, what's going on with your peers, your other, the other doctors? And he said, if I did, they would think I was a bad physician because, you know, it's like, just bear, bear with it. Step up or up or lift. Don't, don't, you know, it's part of the job. Well, physicians are human. Nurses are human. Parents are human. (laughs) Children are human. You know, and because we're human, we care. Because again, at the heart of being human is to care. So Eric Gundry says that the first attempt for, for healing is to acknowledge what's going on. The second is to be able to share your story. And, and, and the third is that you're able to deal with your emotions that help you deal with what's going on. And so he focuses on, on those things and I focus on the taboos that lead to those things. So they're, they're, they're equally together. And when we allow ourselves, again, this process is, isn't as quick as we like it to be. It took me about three years to get back to normal. And because, and I had, I had this coach Leo that helped me. And each time, each year I would see him less and less and less as I was making these appropriate decisions. And so it's, it's, it's not like being knocked off my horse and all of a sudden I understand what's going on. It's rather I gain the more I allow myself to feel and to reflect and, and to trust, the more I'm able to um, overcome that exhaustion. When I saw, saw Leo, I, I, after a month, I said, you know, where am I on, on the scale of, of one to 10? He said, you're, you're at level eight or nine, and I consider 10 irreversible. So right from the get-go, he said, this is going to take time. And I was able to accept that and be able to recognize that I was in this traumatic situation um, for three years. And he said, one day you're going to wake up and you're going to feel you're on the other side of the bridge. And, and that, that's what happened. Yeah, and that's, that's incredible that um, in so much of those taboos are so true too. You know, we're not allowed, even especially as healthcare workers, we're 
you know, something happens and our favorite patient passes away and we're in tears and we're in our boss's office and we're like, well, you have other patients. You, you gotta, you know, you gotta get back out there. And it's like, okay, but they just died. Like I wasn't, you know, um, and you have to like breathe through it and go on to the next person. And you can't even show that you're scared or sad in the next room or again, um, even with like, like you said before about acknowledging death. And, and I do want to go back to that because that's, that is an experience that I have had with patients in healthcare, like, like working as a nurse disease. And it was the most horrible thing because they knew they were dying. They knew that's why everybody was in the room. They were dying and nobody would say, yes, mom, it's, it's your time, you know? Um, that's our culture. Our culture is is to deny the dying process. And because we are so astute with medical care that we think if we just keep doing X, Y, and Z, it's going to prevent the dying. And, and it doesn't. Exactly. We're, we're human. We're all going to die. Um, and oftentimes, alert. oftentimes I'll, I'll say to the patient and, uh, you know, um, how do you how do you feel? What do you think's going on? And they go, they'll shake their head. No, you know, not so good. And I say, well, do you think you have one foot on a banana peel and the other foot in St. Peter's Gate? And they shake their head. And I go, okay, well, let, we're going to support you. You don't have to be afraid. And and the family families are often afraid to say to their loved ones you know i or say to themselves i i you know i really don't want you to die but i know you are and i i'm going to miss you but i want you to be comfortable and all of that should be normalized and should be okay um i know when my grandmother was passing we we knew she was passing and we said hey it's okay it's okay to go, you know, we'll, we'll, you can watch over us. We're, we're still going to be here. We're going to miss you, but you can go, go be with Pepe, go be with your son. Exactly. Um, and that's, and I, oh, and I, I've, like I said, I've been there, I've been in these rooms and I've, and it's the worst when people are sitting there and they're saying, don't go, don't go to their family. And they've been hanging on for hours days it's like give them permission to, and, it, and it hurts and I know death hurts like we've all grieved um but no, no one no one the peace that, we love. that you know just from giving permission to let them pass and you just get peace from it you know it, it's 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 very human not to want the person to die because, exactly. Because you love them. On the other hand, that's what's happening. And I had this experience um, in intensive care where I was called to this woman. And she was very, very afraid. And I, I started talking with her. And, and she said, I can trace my lineage back to the 10th century, Charlemagne. And I said, Wow. You know, and she was talking about it. And I said, just think of all those people in heaven. She was Christian. So I was able to say that. Uh, just think of all those people in heaven that are praying for you and waiting to see you. And she lit up and we said some prayers. And then I left. And a half hour later, she died. Because she felt comfortable that it was okay. Yeah. And that's, and that's just so important offering that peace to someone. And it's so precious. It really, it really is. End of life care is, I always thought of it as more of a privilege than just a specialty in healthcare. Um, I, I it think is a privilege. It's, it a is privilege. A privilege. it's a privilege to be there. And, and it really is. It's, and it's, and it, it it's sad. Yeah. And it can be gruesome sometimes. I don't want to like I don't want to candy coat it and say everyone dies peacefully with a smile in hospice. That's not true. Sometimes there's fluid involved. You know, it's not always pretty, but 
it's life and you know like the like the seasons change and the the trees the leaves on the trees die and fall down we all got to go to to make room for what's next it just it just is um but i i do want to change gears a little bit and talk about your book um your book is called the soul of caregiving can you tell us more about it when i did my um doctoral thesis on on healing and caregiving it became or i became aware of the importance of soul and i became aware of what is it in a person that helps them cope with traumatic events and as i was expressing this to a consultant to write a book he said it's all about soul isn't it and i said yes and that's where the title came in the soul of caregiving uh, a caregiver's guide to healing and transformation and when i finished my dissertation one of the readers said when are you going to write the book and it was like you know someone saying when are you going to write the book when are you going to write the book and that was in 210 and i um i struggled with that until uh 6 years later i woke up one morning and uh, and i said it's time to write the book and i i said well what do you want to write about and 10 things came up and those 10 things are the chapter so the the first has to do with what's the dance that that caregivers experience between between self care and other care so that's the tension it's a dance and then i talked about well how can you get in touch with with that inner part of yourself so what is soul and 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 i i talked about that as the animating force within a person and it it doesn't have a religious connotation it has a spiritual connotation and then i talked about well how do you get in touch with that how do you how do you deal with the conflicts between your your left brain and your right brain you know the the left brain saying you need to be extremely professional and 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 competent in the work that you do uh i don't want someone who fixes bicycles uh taking care of me in surgery okay on the other hand you know can that surgeon uh use his right part of the brain to be compassionate and caring and and uh personable to hear the story of the person they're taking care of i recently had an experience with with my partner's um surgeon who was extremely compassionate and i we i was so overwhelmed by it that you know i gave him my book and i said you 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 really put into practice what i wrote about and so he was happy with that i talked about hospitality i talked about the fact that you know as caregivers we respond to the person in need we do that naturally and then i talked about how how that be, begins a relationship so that's the second aspect or attitude of hospitality and and then i realized as i was writing a book there was a third aspect of hospitality which has to do with how does this interaction with this person affect me that's what we don't do we don't we don't listen to those wonderful moments of 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 of, of gratitude knowing we've done a good job that supports us when we're dealing with difficult situations and, and and so i i talk about hospitality and again we don't reflect so therefore we don't allow those precious moments to strengthen us i i talk about reflection what is reflection and you can experience you know holding your your child for the first time or a grandparent holding a child 
we, you can talk about what, taking a walk or, and then sunset or walking on the beach or going to the mountains and nature, how it inspires you. And so we, we often go from task to task to task to task. And the example what, that you gave of, you know, going to your supervisor and saying, you know, this, this really affected me is an example of, of the healthcare system that doesn't say, well, I'm going to have Emily or I myself are going to cover your patients while you just take a walk around the hospital, you know, something like that. And, um, and when I was dealing with a particular caregiver um, and she was getting uh, care and debriefing, uh, her teammates called the debriefing session a, a um, crybabies club. And so, again, that's, you know, if you show any type of need or emotion, it's considered uh, inappropriate. And, and, and so then I talked about, you know, that we're wounded healers. We're, we're not perfect. And the ancients tried to, to acknowledge that, that we weren't perfect. We're not gods. And how often we meet uh, people that, that think they're, they're God. We do godly work, sacred work, but we're not, we're not gods. And so that's a whole big awareness that we can show our, our weaknesses. We can show our vulnerability. And, and the more we are vulnerable as, um, a, a, uh, deaf psychologist, Mary and Wood, Woodman says that we're, when we're in touch with that vulnerability that's when the gods appear i talk about a practice what what is what is a self-care practice about you know we can talk about the practice of of being a doctor a dentist uh, a caregiver a mother father etc uh but do i make caregiving a practice and then the, one of the last chapters is talks about burnout and, and compassion fatigue. So all of those themes are, are, are developed in, in the book that um, is my gift to the world, uh, allowing caregivers to know they could overcome their compassion fatigue and burnout. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I have not been able to read your book yet, but it is on my list. It, it is definitely on my reading list. And I know a few people who could definitely benefit from it. So um, just, you know, just based on what you're saying, I think pretty much any caregiver could really use this, this information in your book and your sharing. Um, so I have another question for you. And this is kind of my second to last question. What is your favorite self-care technique? Say that again. I'm sorry. What is your favorite self-care technique for yourself? My favorite favorite uh, technique is to pause. I am on the Myers Briggs. I'm an inter. I'm a borderline introvert extrovert. I love to talk with people that give me insight. That's an that's an extrovert, and the introvert is listening and then reflecting on what I've heard. And if I don't pause. I feel like I'm a cat on a hot tin roof. And so I'll often pause. And I, I remember Leo told me once when I, when I said to him, you know, I, I really want to do what the Holy Spirit wants me to do. And he started laughing and I'm looking at him. Why is he laughing? And he said, Edward, the Holy Spirit wants you to do what's the easiest thing to do. And that was over 30 years ago, and I still use it. So when I feel overwhelmed, I say, what's the easiest? I pause, and I say, okay, what's the easiest thing to do? So oftentimes, I'll have two or three things that I'm focusing on for the day. And all of a sudden, I feel this tremendous fatigue, and I allow myself to take a break. Uh, I'm, I am, I'm able to do that. Uh, but if you're at work or at home as a caregiver, it might be something simple 
as while the person is sleeping, I could I could take a short walk. Or I could I can have call call one of my best friends and talk with them. So it's the idea of of, of pausing to reflect and and do what's the easiest thing. And I that's that's I do that all the time. If, that's if, awesome. Yeah. No, I I actually think that that's great. You know, I have I have those moments too. Uh, I kind of recently got into journaling a little bit and, um, you know, just, just doing like gratitude journals and things like that. And that gives me that opportunity to reflect on my day, what's going on and remind me of, both. I think the gratitude journals can sometimes be a little too positive there. If you know what I'm saying, sometimes as caregivers, we have days where not everything is sunshine and rainbows, even when they're bad. So leaving space for, you know, I burnt dinner, at least I didn't burn the house down. You know what I mean? Like, I'm grateful that my house still is fine, even though dinner is toasted. Um, and thank God for Domino's or whatever, or whatever, you know, whatever you want to put in there. Um, I feel like it, you can get creative with journalism and put that and all space not, in there. Oftentimes when you just acknowledge I had a real bad day and you start explaining it, you gain insight. So in, in the book that I have, the revised edition, there are spaces in there with questions and places to uh, write your reflections. So the stories that are in there, I hope, will inspire the reader to experience their own story. And, and the more, again, writing, you start writing, it's like a mantra, and then all of a sudden you gain insight. And so even when you say, you know, I burnt, I burnt the supper tonight and, you know, I felt ucky and my family felt, oh, wow. And I, I did, I allowed myself to say, okay, what's the easiest thing to do? Well, guess what folks were having pizza tonight. I didn't burn the salad so we could have salad. <laughs> I made stuffed peppers last week and they were horrible, 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 horrible. And I, I I said to my partner, I said, um, this is the worst meal I've ever made. And so I decided to uh, fix it and I did, but it, it, um, I had to acknowledge it was the worst thing, worst meal I ever made. We've done some experimental dinners. I can relate to that. We've done some experimental dinners in this house and we've all taken a bite, looked at each other and was like, wants pizza <laughs> like because that's that's the but that's pizza is like the go-to crowd pleaser or at least for my family I can't I can't speak for every family I don't know I don't think I know anybody who doesn't like pizza I I, I think almost everybody unless you're like lactose intolerant and gluten intolerant which does happen but even then you can get gluten frets gluten-free crust and vegan cheese on your pizza. So right. um, I'm going to, I'm going to say, I think almost everybody likes pizza. Uh, it's, it's a general crowd pleaser, but yeah, no, it, you know, like you said, pausing, I think that that's great. And acknowledgement is, is important too, for caregivers. Um, so my final question for you, where can my listeners get more information about you, order your book, learn about your coaching? They can go to my website which is um, soulcare.com. And they could email me at edward at soulcare.com. They can also go to my, go to Amazon to order the book or they on my website, they can order the book from me and I will mail them an autograph um, copy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I will link your website and your email in the show notes. If any of my listeners or any of you guys who listen to Caregiver Chronicles want more information, um, you can find all that in the show notes. Um, Edward, again, thank you so much for being on your, you're incredible. What you're doing is, is you're making life better for caregivers and, you know, I really appreciate it. And not just the family caregiver, 
not just the healthcare worker, all caregivers. And I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you acknowledging it. And to hear it from someone who's been there is just so much more impactful for me as someone who has also been in that burnout position. Um, And so I just want to say that, but um, that will wrap up this week's episode of Caregiver Chronicles. If you liked this episode, I encourage you to like, share, and subscribe to our podcast. The best thing you can do to support our show is to share it with a friend, especially if you know someone who might need or benefit from this information. Um, We do have links in our show notes to buy me a coffee. We also have links to um, Angel Sense, which was one of our affiliates. So feel free to check those out if you want to support the podcast in that way. But please don't ever feel obligated to donate to our show. We'd prefer you share our show with a friend. And with that, I'll wrap up this week's episode of Caregiver Chronicles, and we'll see you next week.